I can't imagine uh, why folks would want to miss the, uh, the next event, which is really a quiz. And we're going to find out who really knows uh, what about engines and epitopes and adjuvants <laughs> and a few other things. It's a way to try to focus your attention. I think we've got, uh, got a quorum, so I'd like to go ahead and get started. Uh, it's a treat for me to be here. Some might ask, what, what's the old Salt Admiral doing here? And I think the real uh, truth of the matter is that uh, 45 years of, of travel and engagement around the world, I'm uh, living proof uh, that a human pincushion can absorb uh, many scores of uh, vaccines and still function, at least to some extent. So uh, we'll, we'll give it a try. <laughs> Uh, in truth, uh, this, uh, this panel is here to, uh, to try to uh, make a connection between something that uh, became pretty obvious to me, and that is the link between health and security. And specifically today, we're, we're talking about vaccines and the, the role they play in this, this business. Uh, to me, it's, uh, it's pretty much of a no-brainer. Uh, if you were here this morning and you saw Dr. Fauci's uh, uh, slides, uh, it doesn't take a uh, math major to see the, the benefit of uh, vaccines and what they've done for people here and, and certainly can do for others. Uh, I think uh, one of the challenges of uh, a group like this in a meeting is that uh, sometimes we, uh, because you have an awful lot of expertise, we're blessed with, uh, with that, and you're going to see with our panelists up here this afternoon, that we tend to dive down into the the weeds and, uh, and we start arguing about uh, which vaccine is going to be the best and what ought to be the priority here and, and uh, how much uh, money from this pot goes to that and so forth. Uh, to me, uh, I would uh, suggest as we open this discussion that we may be back out of that and, and let's just talk a little bit about security and if you would accept that security runs the gamut from uh, the, the usual uh, suspects on the international stage with uh, state boundaries and and all those uh, things that, uh, that one tends to associate with militaries and, and uh, state actors. Uh, and the other side is uh, something that's very real and very close to each of us, and that's personal security. And uh, the role that health plays in personal security is, uh, is quite dramatic. And so as we, uh, as we get into this discussion, uh, tying these things together and seeing what we might be able to do and and what we might appreciate in this, I think, is really important. So if we go back to uh, Tony Fauci's uh, comments, uh, he showed some data that was, I thought, really compelling. And then he had some numbers. He talked about billions. And I'm here to tell you that uh, that's an understatement. And uh, if you look at it in this context, uh, since I spent an awful lot of time uh, around the world in the military, I learned a couple things very early on. One of them was the value of prevention, preventive maintenance, uh, preventive interaction. And the uh, thing I learned was that a minimum amount of, of resources devoted to prevention uh, pays huge dividends. And so what would you rather uh, have? Uh, would you rather uh, have some, if you, in the big scheme of things, look at the amount of resources that are actually applied to this issue of vaccines, it's pretty minimal compared to uh, some other uh, resources that are devoted to, to problems that have gotten out of hand and now we're trying to dig ourselves out of a hole. So it seems to me that if we keep in mind that um, we can do a tremendous amount of good with a relatively small amount of resources in advance of problems becoming the kind of challenges that cost us trillions of dollars to dig out of uh, very deep holes. And so as we, as we kick this off, uh, we're really fortunate here to have uh, three particularly uh, well-versed and expert people that, that really cover the gamut in, uh, in this business uh, of vaccines and, uh, and security and, and global health. So uh, first, uh, we're going to hear from Dr. Steve Kochi, who is the uh, walk-and-talk -talk and encyclopedic expert in vaccines, Centers uh, for Disease Control. Uh, he's been in this business for a, a very, very long time. Yeah, he's a medical doctor uh, with a great pedigree, and uh, he's going to start us off. And then we have uh, someone who's actually been down there with his sleeves rolled up, uh, getting his hands dirty, if you would, in the field, uh, and that's Marcus Geiser from uh, ICRC, International Committee of the Red Cross, uh, who uh, he hails from Switzerland uh, in the high mountains, and he spent an awful lot of time in some pretty, pretty dirty, dusty places the last several years, uh, <laughs> last two years in particular in Afghanistan. 
uh, doing, uh, doing the Lord's work out there in some very, very difficult uh, situations. And to try to put a bow around this discussion, uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, Eric Schwartz here. He's currently the dean at the Humphrey School up at the University of Minnesota. He's uh, a man with a very, very extensive background uh, that spans the policy world. He used to be here at the NSC, he used to be an assistant secretary of state uh, in the academic world. He's been uh, with NGOs, with the UN. He's got a resume that, uh, that just goes on and on that touches many of you here. And so with these three gentlemen, I think we're pretty well, well placed to, uh, to have a discussion in, uh, about this business of security and, and tying it uh, to vaccines. So, if I could ask Steve to come up here to start us off. Uh, thanks very much for your attention. The place is full. Over to you, Steve. Thank you, Admiral Fallon. And uh, I'd like to kick things off with a few, just a few comments and some ideas that I'd like to throw out there to uh, get the discussion flowing. And I'm going to divide my comments into general issues and then taking the U.S. perspective uh, and finally, uh, uh, issues that uh, conflict affected uh, countries face. First, first of all, from the general perspective, uh, I, I hope it's clear today that we're not talking about uh, bioterrorism uh, related vaccines like smallpox vaccine or anthrax vaccine, but uh, the broader issue of how vaccines promote uh, both global and national uh, security. Um, it all goes back to the fact that social inequities drive conflict and unrest and civil unrest. And vaccines are a tool for achieving health equity. And uh, uh, this is uh, uh, true both on the global level as well as on the national level. Uh, vaccines uh, and immunization are a global public good. Now, what exactly does that mean? <clears throat> that means that vaccines are near universally uh, in demand. The benefits of immunization transcend national borders, and we see this um, come uh, home to roost every time we have importations of vaccine-preventable diseases uh, from one country to another, from one region of the world to another. Uh, also, no one need be or should be excluded from receiving these global public goods. So uh, pursuit of global immunization is uh, a, a, a huge contribution to global health security and equity. And uh, finally, on, on, uh, in general terms, from the point of view of political leaders, good health is good politics. Uh, so effective health interventions, such as vaccines, uh, in the view of uh, many, and if not most, political leaders, uh, dramatically improve the health of the population, contribute to economic productivity, uh, and foster economic development. Uh, so this promotes national security through uh, both political and economic stability. Now, if we look at the U.S. perspective, uh, uh, the U.S. has both a humanitarian and a national security self-interest in reducing the global burden of uh, vaccine-preventable diseases. Um, the U.S. has been free, here's some examples. The U.S. has been free of polio since 1979, but the polio virus is just one plane ride away from the few remaining countries where the polio virus still circulates. Uh, we're all very familiar with the national security threat of a potential pandemic influenza epidemic. And uh, on, in terms of measles, the U.S. has experienced the highest number of measles cases since 1996. All of these due to um, importations of uh, measles virus and, and small outbreaks that have occurred as a result of traveling uh, U.S. travelers to other parts of the world and, and uh, visitors to the United States. So these ongoing outbreaks of, uh, of measles in the U.S. highlight the interconnectedness of the world today and show that outbreaks of measles around the world leave the United States vulnerable to imported measles virus. Uh, these cases cause serious illness, hospitalization, disruption of the community and of the health uh, infrastructure, and they are very costly, and, and I can get later on, if time permits, to some examples of this. Uh, so if we don't support uh, the global side of, uh, of the effort to reduce uh, measles, 
then we're being penny wise and, and pound foolish in, in the way we approach uh, uh, protection of our, of our citizens. And finally, um, uh, some of the issues that the conflict affected countries face. Um, and I'm going to focus uh, a bit on polio eradication since that's the model for, the, for delivery right now of immunization services in conflicted, conflict affected uh, areas of the world. Uh, one of the greatest challenges for polio eradication um, in the few remaining countries has been getting access to children in conflict affected and security compromised areas. Um, We've had a very successful effort in many countries that goes back to 1985 uh, during the civil war in El Salvador. And uh, at that time, and this has been sustained through today, uh, the development of what's called Days of Tranquility, where there are negotiated ceasefires between the warring factions uh, to allow vaccination teams on either side of the conflict to reach children with vaccination during mass campaigns, where this has become a feature. And in countless countries that have been affected by civil conflict uh, leading right up to today, uh, this has been a strategy that has proven effective uh, to get into these areas, at least for a brief interval of time, perhaps one to two weeks, to deliver, uh, in this instance, uh, oral polio vaccine, but also in many instances to deliver other health interventions uh, where appropriate and where, where feasible. And so this is taking advantage of, I think, the primacy of immunization as one of the bedrocks of primary health care and using what health infrastructure is available uh, in, on the immunization side to deliver uh, the health interventions, including vaccines, uh, during these uh, uh, ceasefires. So um, I'll conclude just by saying that um, with polio eradication as a, as a model uh, for working in areas of conflict, um, uh, we, we have been successful in, uh, in many, many countries, and this carries over into our, our work in vaccines and immunization in achieving equity and access to uh, immunization, in establishing disease surveillance systems and mechanisms special mechanisms for delivering health intervention in these uh, very uh, uh, unusual areas, and in some instances in revitalizing and strengthening immunization systems through additional externally provided resources um, and delivery of additional vaccines besides the polio vaccine. So I'll stop there, and I hope that that gets the discussion ideas flowing. Okay. Steve, thanks very much. So. Uh You've certainly, uh, I think, got uh, captured now one aspect of this security, the value of vaccines and, and interventions to helping security. It's another dimension, too, that uh, we might be able to get uh, a draw out from Marcus here, because uh, actually doing the health intervention in the field uh, uh, has a couple of prerequisites, one of them being actual local or tactical security. And so he's the man that's actually had to deal with this. Marcus, if you could come up and uh, tell us how things really are out there. Good afternoon, everybody. First of all, yes, I do come from Switzerland, not from the Swiss mountains, from the Swiss lake. <laughs> Nonetheless, my Swiss-German accent, of course, will remain. So I hope you will, uh, you will forgive me. Uh, first of all, thank you very much to CIS uh, for, having in, for having invited the ICRC to come to this, uh, to come to this event. International Committee of the Red Cross, very briefly, it, we are an international humanitarian organization based in Geneva. Uh, our mandate is to protect and assist victims of war all around the world in all conflict zones. Our mandate is deeply enshrined in the Geneva Conventions, one of the foundations of the law of armed conflict. Uh, ICRC is facilitator for the delivery of vaccination in Afghanistan, very broadly. This is the issue I want to very quickly touch upon. And what Stephen said, access, yes indeed, the question of access, how do we reach uh, people who are in need of vaccination in very complex environment, environments, and Afghanistan probably is one of those. Uh, let me say what the ICC is doing, uh, first of all. Uh, how do we actually facilitate delivery of vaccination? 
The ICRC's invo involvement as a facilitator in the polio campaign started in 2007 in, Af in Afghanistan. At that time, the Afghan Minister of Public Health suggested to WHO to contact the ICRC for support to access areas with strong armed opposition presence. Uh, that means Taliban. Uh, ICRC uh, distinguishes itself to consider itself as a neutral, independent, humanitarian actor. Uh, I do not want to talk about these concepts uh, at length, but nonetheless, what do we mean by that? I think we from the ICRC have to realize that aid is always an injection into a social, political, uh, and also economical environment. So principles of humanitarian action are here very important to provide an organization like the ICRC. Uh, guidance and regulation. Humanity stands for respect for human being. Impartiality means assisting those most in need with no discrimination. Neutrality involves no taking part in military operations or ideological controversies. I, neutrality in that sense is an operational posture. And the independence is the obvious operational predisposition. That's the result of those principles. Uh, that explains why the ICRC has developed contacts with the armed opposition, the Taliban, in Afghanistan over the last few years. Let me now quickly go back again. ICRC as a facilitator for the delivery of vaccination in Afghanistan. Uh, back in 2007, when we got this uh, explicit request by the Afghan MOPH, uh, this was by the way authorized by President Karzai, uh, to actually see the ICRC, uh, to, to see the ICRC as, a, as, a, as a facilitator to bring other actors such as WHO, UNICEF, and of course, first and, more, first and foremost, uh, the Minister of Public Health into those disputed areas. For each polio campaign, the ICRC receives a letter from, from the Taliban uh, with a letterhead, Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, as they call themselves. Uh, and this letter is handed over to WHO. And this letter is then handed over to the teams of vaccinators uh, that actually can carry this particular letter in all those areas where they think are more let's say, disputed areas, okay, where the Afghan Ministry of Public Health would not have an easy and, and easy access. And this all sounds very simple. Of course, on the ground realities, things are a bit more complicated. For example, when I was uh, working for the ICRC in southern Afghanistan in our office in Kandahar, we would indeed bring together in a meeting room of uh, representatives of the Afghan Ministry of Public Health, of course, the representatives of UNICEF, WHO, and of course, also people that we know through our work, through our network, uh, who are close uh, to the armed opposition, who are tolerated by the armed opposition, at times even are members of the armed opposition. The ICRC was considered to be, and still is considered to be, a credible actor as this facilitator, because in the southern part of Afghanistan, the ICRC has a very comprehensive approach in how to actually access, uh, respond to, to needs, health needs. Uh, we support the second largest hospital in Kandahar. We run a very complicated network of private taxis that retrieve wounded, bring them over the front line, and bring them to those hospitals. And we also uh, run a few first aid posts. Uh, that particular, and I conclude on this, that particular uh, uh, response to the needs of health, uh, the health needs, I'm sorry, uh, of course, made us a very credible, uh, cre made us a credible actor to indeed have the role as facilitator. And of course, we from the ICC believe strongly that our neutral, independent, humanitarian action, the way I explained it, actually helps us to do that. I would conclude with a few challenges. Today, it is very clear that in many areas in Afghanistan, uh, the provision of health, in particular vaccination, is very complex. I think it has gotten more complex. A simple letter, unfortunately, does not always do the job anymore. Uh, we see the fragmentation of, uh, of, of various parties to the conflict, the armed opposition. We also see the, the proliferation of irregular armed forces. They are, they are nonetheless accepted by the, by the government of President Karzai, also supported by uh, NATO forces. Uh, we continue to see, unfortunately, a rather dysfunctional Ministry of Public Health, where there's a very clear center and periphery divide. If you talk to the, uh, if you talk to the Minister of Public Health in Kandahar, he may not have leverage of what's going on, of how actually the teams of vaccinators uh, uh, operate, okay? The same, and I conclude on this one, the same if the armed opposition. Again, a letter 
from the Quetta Jura uh, of the Taliban uh, does not necessarily mean that a small commander, if I may say so, who may not even be able to read that letter, may actually accept that. So yes, uh, the role of a facilitator depends very much on the commitment of all of those who are around the table, the various health actors, but also the political actors or the armed actors. Thank you so much. Marcus, thank you very much. And to, uh, to try to uh, tie this together, I'd like to invite uh, Dean Schwartz to share, among other things, uh, the perspective of how policymakers view this uh, nexus between uh, health and vaccines and security and what factors uh, go through their minds as they're making decisions regarding resources and, and uh, allocation of effort. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, CSIS as well for, um, for putting on this uh, important meeting. Uh, I should say, parenthetically, as I was preparing for um, uh, this uh, in, in my new perch at the University of Minnesota, it was heartening to see how serious uh, that institution, as I know so many other institutions, have taken on um, uh, the challenge of uh, dealing with uh, uh, infectious diseases. Um, uh, let me, let me um, offer uh, five observations uh, <clears throat> in this area from the perspective of somebody who spent most of the last several years dealing uh, with international humanitarian response. Um, first, my first observation would be um, that those of us who are concerned about this issue uh, should adopt uh, Sutton's law, um, which is that uh, you should consider the obvious before you uh, look to other alternatives. Uh, Willie Sutton, the bank robber, uh, is responsible for that law, which when they asked him, um, why do you rob banks, he said, that's where the money is. And uh, the analogy, of course, is obvious. Why is it important to pursue vaccination in uh, situations of conflict and um, failed, state, uh, failed states? And the answer is that that's where uh, the people in greatest, the, the large number of people in great need are. Um, these statistics may be somewhat outdated, but um, in review in, for this presentation, uh, statistics from several years ago suggested that 65% of internationally significant outbreaks of vaccine-preventable diseases are in areas of civil conflict and collapsed states. That the leading cause of morbidity and mortality uh, in such, set, such settings um, are such um, uh, diseases. And so I would say we should start with Sutton's Law, and, uh, which underscores the importance of focusing on this area, even if it's hard to do. Um, the second uh, point that I would make from a policy perspective in the, with respect to international humanitarian response is that movement matters. Um, what I mean by that is we need to address the problem uh, due to its migration impacts um, on issues with humanitarian but also national security implications. And this plays out uh, in several ways. First, uh, people on the run who are not, uh, who are not vaccinated, who have not um, um, encounter host populations. Uh, refugees encounter host populations, many of whom then thereby become far more susceptible. Uh, secondly, as we've seen, um, diseases easily cross borders um, and have implications for foreign populations. We resettle upwards of 75,000 refugees uh, every year from places like uh, the, the Dab in northeast Kenya. Uh, so the idea that the impact of the absence of immunization on us might not be uh, significant or profound, I think may be um, uh, uh, very short-sighted. And then third, uh, there are humanitarian implications because people who are, at f who are fleeing, who cross borders, hopefully, and in many cases, at least a couple of million cases in Africa over the last decade, they go home. 
they go home. Better they should go home um, having been uh, vaccinated um, rather than go home and increase the risks to those uh, who, who never left in the first place. So my second proposition is that movement matters. My third proposition is that uh, in, we need to tailor solutions to meet um, problems. Be aware of the need to modify interventions uh, to the special dimensions of humanitarian settings. Um, for example, there is evidence, and I'm not the expert on this, I just read the evidence, uh, but there is some evidence that in humanitarian settings uh, there is a stronger rationale for vaccinations for diseases, for, for, to vaccinate um, uh, children to a higher age, to a, to a greater age, um, because many of them, uh, many of them who are refugees or who who have suffered um, conditions of, of, of poverty and conflict may not have been, uh, may not have had access uh, to vaccinations. So there's some evidence that, that, that increasing the age level for vaccinations in those settings makes sense. There's evidence that uh, a focus, if you have limited priorities on um, uh, those diseases that spread most easily or have the gravest consequences. So without trying to dictate the specific outcomes, uh, I think the point is still is, is very valid, that you need to tailor interventions to the special circumstances of humanitarian settings. The fourth observation I made is that um, not all humanitarian settings are created equal. And that's, this is sort of a codicil to the previous point. Um, for example, beyond the urgent quick onset emergency, um, there are millions and millions of people, of, um, of people in humanitarian distress who are in protracted humanitarian situations where, the, where their circumstances may be tragic, but ironically, there may be opportunities for um, uh, the building of local capacity in circumstances where in, in, quick, uh, in, in, in contrast to quick onset emergencies where that possibility may be more remote. Um, similarly, not similarly, but along the same lines, we have the challenge of uh, urban refugees, um, people who are fleeing, who may, need, may, who may be in need um, of immunization, but who are not in camp light settings increasingly in urban environments with host populations. That also imposes more significant challenges, but, and different challenges. So my fourth point, again, is not all humanitarian settings are created equal. And my fifth, my fifth and final point is don't assume that doing the right thing is an inadequate rationale to do the right thing. Um, did, you, did everyone get that? Um, <laughs> what I mean by that is, you know, I, I, I think the, 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 the national security rationales for action in this area are clear and convincing. Um, but also sometimes I felt in government, I certainly did it, uh, sometimes I felt that we made these rationales. I, 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 I said probably a thousand times as Assistant Secretary that um, if we address humanitarian uh, suffering and we create conditions for peace and reconciliation, then we offer the prospect of stability in circumstances where despair and chaos can ultimately undermine our national security interests. I, 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 I said that, I, I probably said that 300 times. Um, and I believe it. But sometimes I think policymakers say it because we feel that it resonates with those who are going to be funding us. And I would submit, at least in the case of humanitarian response, response to people who are in the most desperate need, the evidence that I'm aware of is that it's really the doing the right thing rationale that has resonated more significantly with our strongest supporters in the Congress and our strongest supporters in the non-governmental uh, community. Um, 
And I think that's, that's, that's important. That doesn't, that's not always the case, I think, with development. But in the area of humanitarian response, that's been the case. And so to the extent that you know, there is an interest in pursuing greater resources in this area, um, in the area of humanitarian response, I would not assume that doing the right thing is necessarily an inadequate argument to get the right outcome. Thank you. Eric, thanks. <laughs> Eric, thanks. Great point on which to uh, end the tea up here. So I'd like to open it up to uh, questions or comments from the audience. Uh, any uh, additional uh, thoughts or uh, ideas that you might want to uh, toss in front of these uh, experts before uh, we let them uh, get into a dialogue? I think we've got some mics. Yeah, coming up uh, at your six. Thanks, Admiral. Um, since so much of uh, the narrative of enemies of an open society is that the West doesn't care enough about the poor and the disenfranchised, uh, how much of the policy issue can you bring to the Hill about things like inoculations and the like? And how much can the military uh, help encourage the benefit that vaccinations do in bringing um, the good of the West to the disenfranchised of the world? Eric, do you want to sure. start off with the policy piece? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think um, to the extent that, uh, you know, I think if the, if the goal is, um, if the goal is, and this is a preliminary response, I could be dead wrong, right? So please appreciate that. But um, because the stakes are very high, right? And so if you're wrong and the stakes are high, then the implication. So, so take everything I say with a grain of salt, but my, uh, uh, but my reaction to your comment is if, if you're talking about increasing the magnitude of resources um, for vaccinations, for immunization in humanitarian settings, um, one strategy might be not to take aim at the Congress, but to take aim at the administration. And what I mean by that is that um, I, think the, I think if there are any foreign aid accounts that are going to be generously funded, it's the humanitarian accounts. At least that's what history, recent history, seems to suggest. Um, my bureau got $100 million, uh, consistently $100 to $200 million more than we asked for in uh, an environment that was extremely difficult for the budget, right? And so I think if, if the goal is to increase the magnitude of resources, and I think this, um, if the goal is to increase the magnitude of resources in humanitarian settings, in addition to taking aim at Congress, of course you should, but I would also, I would look at the administration. I would look at the accounts of PRM and, and DCHA at and USAID and, and ask the question, are you allocating enough support for this area? Are you pro pressing your international partners, UNHCR and others, to re um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, WHO, um, whatever? Are you pressing your partners uh, to commit institutionally and resource-wise? So I think I would, I would, you know, on the on the humanitarian side, um, I think I would do both. I would look at the Congress, but also the administration. If I could just add a couple of thoughts on the, the, uh, the military aspect of your question. The military certainly can and does respond uh, to humanitarian situations, crises around the world. The key attributes are organization and speed. Uh, but uh, for the longer term, the bigger picture, seems to me uh, someone mentioned this morning uh, in this for the long haul, set longer term goals. And that's where you need to be prepping the battle uh, ground uh, in terms of uh, basically at the end of the day trying to build host nation uh, capabilities it seems to me to be able to sustain the kinds of things. So we can intervene, we can do all kinds of things, uh, many in this room do magnificent work but uh, for the long term a uh, key thing I believe is to uh, is to get uh, folks on the ground to be able to sustain this and keep going. So the military can help uh, but primarily your, your speedy responders. Uh, what else folks? Hey, while well, you're... Uh, you're gonna if I may just uh, add, yes, sure. the role of the military down in Afghanistan, of course, the military has played an important role, uh, certainly not as a provider of vaccination, as the Admiral has just said, yes. I see the role of the military very much as 
trying to support the environment that is conducive to allow a vaccination to take place. Okay, uh, that is, I think, the, this is the, the unique role that the military can play. Yes. Sure. Yeah, I think we have both a challenge and an opportunity uh, in in advocating for uh, vaccines and immunization as a as a very concrete uh, way to. Uh, uh, gain and sustain trust uh, with the, the communities uh, uh, and, uh, and build that trust and that engagement over a long period of time. Uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, these are uh, major complex uh, situations that have the military dimension that goes, it goes far beyond that. So uh, uh, we have a, a need to do our best in advocacy to uh, to demonstrate that the way that for the longer term that we that we gain the that we win the hearts and minds of uh, of the population are through other concrete means such as uh, such as delivery of vaccines. Uh, Steve, you mentioned in your uh, discussion uh, the topic of pandemics, and since this is uh, a widely held perception as uh, as a real challenge to to security internationally, uh, what would you see as the recommendations for dealing with this uh, uh, in advance? What, what can we do to get prepared, better prepared and to be more uh, uh, rapidly forthcoming if we're faced with these in the future? Well, that's a very good question, a very complex issue. I'm certainly not an expert in this, but uh, um, we need to keep this very high on the priority list. Uh, in terms of our in terms of our preparedness, and as uh, Dr. Fauci uh, indicated uh, this morning, um, uh, from the U.S. perspective, uh, building a strong as strong as possible a uh, seasonal influenza vaccination program really creates the infrastructure, the vaccine capacity to deal with uh, a pandemic uh, if and when it uh, should occur. And that applies uh, globally as well. I think our, our, our role from the U.S. Uh, side is to, is to support um, developing countries to build that capacity, to, uh, to implement uh, seasonal influenza vaccination programs, to uh, build the global supply of uh, influenza vaccines so that uh, when a pandemic occurs, we have the capacity both human and financial and the, uh, from the manufacturing, uh, from the manufacturers to address that pandemic as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks. Uh, Marcus, you mentioned in your, uh, your remarks your perception that uh, the uh, things were changing uh, in the arena that uh, were making uh, distribution of health uh, services more difficult. Did you perceive this as, as a local issue in Afghanistan or there's some structural uh, larger picture items here? Uh, of course, in Afghanistan, uh, there's, it's very obvious that things have become more complex and it's simply linked to the fact, uh, to the circumstances that we see very often in internal wars, where you have indeed uh, uh, this fragmentation of armed actors, this proliferation of armed actors, and where you also have competing authorities. You have not only state and non-state actors having guns, you have also uh, uh, non-state actors, uh, for example in Afghanistan, the Taliban, who, who actually run their own Ministry of Public Health. And what I think is very important is that uh, in such a context, if those who, wish to pro those who want to provide vaccination simply talk only to the state Minister of Public Health, but do not consider uh, the presence of other actors on the ground. That will simply not, uh, not allow uh, the provision of, of vaccination. I think that's something that, that I have seen, or the ICC has seen in, in, many, in, in many contexts, yes. And I think this is a, this is a key issue here, yes. <coughs> vaccination in a day, I think it was said, yes, there are no, vaccination doesn't, doesn't know any borders. Yes, indeed, not only state borders between Pakistan and Afghanistan, uh, but actually also within a country, yes. Yes, I, I, just to re just to emphasize uh, what Marcus has been saying, and uh, to put it in very concrete terms, uh, and it applies to Afghanistan and the uh, the cooperation with the Taliban. It, it applies in uh, Somalia with uh, cooperation with uh, the warlords and the, the clan chiefs. But in in, in the Afghanistan uh, circumstance, uh, 
for years, um, uh, a, a agreement was worked out for one round of immunization after another over a period of years. The Taliban appointed the, uh, the vaccination teams from the communities. The vaccine was supplied by the government of Af Afghanistan and international partners. And then the, the Taliban reported back in on the results. And this was, it was a very workable strategy. And uh, ICRC had a, uh, had a central role in making this happen, uh, happen and keep and sustaining it over time. Great, thanks. Spam. Can we get a mic up here, please? Thank you. Again, my name is Ann Thompson. I'm with the Core Group Polio Project uh, with World Vision. And my question is just to the panel in general. If you could highlight the three main things that need to happen to best promote worldwide immunization and address those to the U.S. government or the Western world, what would they be? Anybody like to take a shot at that one? So uh, three, three things, uh, three top priority oh, tasks okay. to uh, accelerate the uh, value of immunizations okay. in the world. This is uh, <laughs> a, a panel stumper, huh? Um, well, uh, go ahead. You mean, I, the, the problem with answering the, the, the question is I think that, at least from my perspective, I, I think I, I think our presence on this panel um, may suggest, and in my, my own view, you've heard, that a, a focus on the most challenging environments, uh, environments of, of, um, of conflict, of, um, of humanitarian suffering, uh, of state failure, I th my own view is a, a sustained and substantial focus on those areas, as, as my comment suggested, is uh, critical um, because, as, as I said before, you know, Sutton's rule, Sutton's law applies. Um, um, uh, and, and if you're going to solve a, uh, a disastrous problem, you've got to go where the bulk of the suffering really is. Um, and I think it, 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 ta it will take a significant commitment of resources, but it will also take a, a commitment to best practices um, because the, um, the challenges of access in those kinds of environments are significant and substantial. So there are ways you can address that um, under any circumstances, um, uh, careful surveying of the population, careful site selection uh, in, in these sorts of, uh, of, of, of situations, um, uh, um, uh, careful preparation, um, but ultimately, the, the most significant challenges, in my view, are going to be challenges related to access. And I would say one thing that the government, our government should be doing, and I suspect we already are doing it, is um, preparing a very careful look at um, how we managed and how the international community managed um, the, um, the outbreak, the measles outbreak, in the context of the Horn um, uh, uh, humanitarian uh, uh, disaster. Um, we've got, I think there are probably going to be some important lessons learned from that experience, both in terms of why it wasn't better prevented and, 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 and in terms of how, um, how we responded, how the international community responded, and whether that response could have been more effective. Okay. Yeah. Sort of a non-answer to your question. About 30 seconds. A very good question. Uh, when <coughs> When you put the question, I was sitting here having done a background paper giving my top 10, wondering, let's see, which three of those top 10 am I going to use? But I think uh, what I wanted to say is, the, to me, the, the most important issue is, uh, is partnership. And in the global uh, vaccine enterprise, uh, the, the road to success is to have a, a fully elaborated partnership that combines uh, uh, government ownership, industry, uh, community leaders, uh, the, the private sector, and the non-government organizations, especially given the topic we're talking about, and NGOs that can work in these conflict-affected areas. And it's the, that's the, the secret to success, the number one secret to success, in my view. 
Marcus, a quick one. If I just uh, would like to uh, develop a little bit what my uh, colleagues have just said. The value of immunization, I think that was, was, your, was your question. Uh, I agree, of course, and I think Eric very well with his five points has actually already given you, in my opinion, an, an answer to your question. Uh, develop this a little bit further. Uh, just how do we, for, as, we, as, we as we from the ICC talk, talk to non-state actors, how do we try to, how can we manage to uh, convince them of the value of immunization? That is sometimes quite complicated, yes. And, uh, and sometimes uh, very simple solutions actually are probably the best. In, in, in the case of Afghanistan, if you have someone from the Taliban who is very, who doesn't like the idea, it's something from the West, etc. What you do, you make sure that, for example, that's what I tried to do and managed a few times, you make sure that he takes his son, okay. So we talk to his son, okay, and I, I, you can tell him, you may not be interested in that, but you're certainly interested in the well-being of your son. And that usually really, Brought a, brought a, brought, let's say, brought this debate about a yes or no vaccination to a very abrupt end because it was very clear. So I think little, it's also about responsible leadership. So small personal things uh, matter. Uh, if I could uh, wrap this up, uh, Anne, with one of my own observations, maybe a corollary to where we started with uh, Sutton's uh, first law, and that would be if, uh, if we ought to focus on the obvious, then uh, maybe we ought to also take a little bit uh, sharper focus on the obvious low-hanging fruit. And so one of the role, key roles of leadership is to make decisions and let's decide there's some things that can be done very quickly uh, to great effect and let's do them. So thanks very much for your attention and thanks Thank to the you. panelists Thank for their you. views. Thank you.